All right, Barbaki. Well, it's 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 an old. I get the feeling the Barbaki's. I think the Barbaki might be closer to the mainstream. I think mm -hmm. that Rotman is the one who's being the maverick. Even mm. mentions in a footnote that he's using non-standard um, terminology. Ah. Okay. So, well, hard to know since you just know between the books that we're looking at. Composition series isn't composition series also in like um, Hungerford. That Hungerford handy. Mm. Yeah, page one oh eight. Um yeah, Borbaki's notation is weird. Uh, well you kind of expect it since it's such a classic uh, aka old book. Um but yeah. Yeah. So what Rotman calls a normal series is what Hungerford calls a subnormal series. <laughs> really? Wait, you have the composition series? Right. And composition series is if the factor groups are simple. simple. Right. And that agrees with Rotman. I yeah. Think. Right, so Hungerford centers everything around subnormal, Rotman everything around normal. <laughs> And yeah, he has a footnote, right? Some authors use terms normal, where we use subnormal. So, yeah. But what Burbaki calls a composition series is just a, what we've been calling a normal series. Ouch. So what Burbaki calls a composition series doesn't assume anything special about the, the factor groups. So, what we call Doesn't. composition series, what is that in Burbaki's language? I have to check. What we call a composition series if we assume that all of the um, intermediate groups are distinct so that nothing's repeated. Mm -hmm. It's what Burbaki calls the principal series. Ah, right. Yeah. So, in our problem, it refers to principal series. Mm -hmm. And that's the equivalent of what we would be calling a strictly decreasing composition series. All right, but he, Burbaki also starts from normal series, right? Uh, uh, no, he starts from composition series and then says it's normal if all your um, groups are um, stable. Normal stable subgroups of G, yeah. Of G, not of the preceding ah, one in the list, okay. but of G. And that's what um, that's what Hungerford calls a normal series. Rotman never defines such a thing. Rotman never considers whether all the groups are normal in the big group, only when they're normal in the next one in the list. Mm -hmm. And that's what Hungerford calls subnormal. Damn. And I think the rest of the word calls subnormal. But remember that construction you did last time where you inserted one composition series right. between yeah. every two terms and the other? I mm -hmm. forget which lemma that was called. I right. think that part one is basically reproving that. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Essentially, but here um, we have... Um, I think there are two proofs. The first one is um, you have to ex you have to show that uh, two equivalent normal series are finer than the composition series of each one. Mm, and he says uh, we have to use the 
Schreier refinement theorem, whatever. Uh, the second one, he, the second approach is by inserting the subgroup. So that's what we did in Rotman, or at least something analogous. But isn't the proof of Schreier exactly that trick of inserting one series in the other? Well, he said he assumes that there's a different one, so you have to think about it. I mean, it yeah, things. he he's putting it as if they're two different things. But I found Schreier in um, Rabaki, but I didn't read that proof yet. So maybe he does prove it a different way. Right. I don't know. But... Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of It wasn't of anything... Yeah. So that one's kind of gone toward the bottom of my list. Okay. But as I'm just skimming Trier... Oh, actually... Oh. It looks like that's exactly how he's proving it. He has the Zassen House limo and says that Schreier follows from it by doing this thing of inserting one series in the other. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> That's ambiguous. Um... So yeah, I don't, I don't really understand why these are two different proofs. One seems to be applying Schreier's theorem, and the other one seems to be reproving Schreier's theorem. <laughs> mm. Or maybe there's a way of doing it directly in this situation, which is like proving a special case of Schreier's theorem. I don't know. I don't know. How are others doing on, on the homework? I know that today's not the homework day, but yeah. I've got four, five, and seven, I feel like. And I feel like I'm making progress on two. Mm hmm Yeah, I kind of um, put in like a few quote unquote computational <laughs> problems the first and the uh, fifth one, just to, you know, I think the fifth one is a bit different, but the first one is uh, just to get used to Zilla. Yeah, um, I have trouble with most of one because I haven't reviewed those. Mm -hmm. They're not called Twisted Products, but there's some name for them. Semi-direct products. Thing is hard to get a, an exact count without those, but maybe others have had better luck than I have. Two, I feel like I can do. Three, I noticed that Hursting gives a star to, in terms of difficulty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think like most undergrad courses don't touch on like Jordan Holder. Um, I asked a few people, um, most of them didn't do that. I think even like I... Martin doesn't do it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see it, and it might have been in Hursting, but I don't know. Mm. No, we didn't cover it in my class. There was something about like these uh, these things about you know the group actions and stuff with nilpotent groups. We didn't do much of that. I'm seeing this in like a Burbaki now, and he has some stuff. But yeah, so... yeah I don't see it in Hursting. Mm -hmm. Burbaki starts with the derived series. 
and he defines that inductively. So that's the series weight. So the one with commutators? Uh, yeah, I guess. Mm. Then he defines what's solvable to this der derived series. But in Rotman, we saw solvability to normal stuff. Yeah, he mentioned that again, we saw later, where he said that there were a couple of different definitions. And one was whether there was one of these series that eventually terminated in um, the trivial subgroup. Mm -hmm. But I was getting toward the end of the section. I was starting to get, I was getting lost friend lost <laughs> Ah, he defines the Jordan Holder series before the theorem, or does he? Who? Bubaki. Uh, he has Schreier's theorem before Zassenhaus lemma, but he mentions blah, 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 this follows from the following lemma. And then Jordan Holder comes a few pages later. Right. You're, you're on which page? Uh, 43 is the statement of Jordan Holder. 43, okay. I was way past that. Oh. Summit and Foot do have Jordan and Holder in there. That's that's weird, because I saw like some around 60 page, um, what is that, silo groups come oh. in. Yeah. But yeah. we knew that, or I knew that, because that's where I was studying at first. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I'll have to also do some work on problem 6 and problem 7. Um, 7, I don't really have much of an idea on what to do. Well, I hope I did it, did it right. Mm -hmm. I, I think I proved something a little bit more general and then got it from there. We'll look at it okay. tomorrow and see whether what I wrote was just nonsense. <laughs> um, yeah, number four, I also don't have much of an idea how to do it. Um, I'll have to think about it. But yeah, the free I used something. all three CLO theorems. For four? For four. Ah, okay. Hmm, ouch. Okay. So we have today modules, so finally we're entering some interesting stuff. You've been um, looking forward to them. <laughs> um, yeah, we have modules, we'll go to modules, I'm not sure, how many weeks are we spending? Five weeks? Three, I think. On modules. We are spending uh, three weeks, yeah, five sessions on it. Um, sorry, six sessions, uh, six lectures. Um, yeah, what I liked about Hungerford when I was like um, going to what to pick for modules is that he ends with algebras, and that's um, very neat for us because we're going to have multilinear algebra just after that. Um, that one is going to be really heavy. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do that, but um, it'll help because I have previously intuition about multilinear algebra, um, Lie algebras and stuff like that. I've even 
then some of exterior differentiation and stuff, but I haven't got back to it in a long time. Um, but that's even that's not even like um, halfway through because we have the big commutative algebra and field theory. So <laughs> this course is really long. I feel it. Uh, get us through modules first. Yep. So Hungerford. I know Hungerford for his categorical language. He does talk about it and like that stuff, right? I believe later. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which he actually is... introduces it very early on. Mm -hmm. Way back in chapter one. So, yeah, we'll have a lot to do, deal with. Um, and if we'll need anything to do with categories, the last chapter is for reference. I guess he mentions it in the preface that it's not really dependent on any other chapters. So. Yeah. Okay. So we did rings, um, we're going to continue uh, from there to build up on modules and yeah. So we'll see several types of modules, um, three modules are kind of the most interesting aspects. Um, because you get vector spaces from there um, but uh, we'll also have other kind of things so what's a module so for a module you first need a ring you have a ring R um, then um, left module because that's how we're defining the mappings here um, so a left R module R module because of the ring that we're t um, inducing the module from um, it's an additive abelian group A, uh, which has this, um, which is binary operator, um, taking elements um, um, from um, R and A to A, right? So this is um, a, a way of operating on R. Right? So um, right, so the R module consists of an additive abelian group A. It has this bi binary operator. Um, which satisfies uh, these three things. So if you've done linear algebra, you know um, for vector spaces you have these uh, conditions. And um, so this bilinear um, operator is a function, but it must satisfy is that it's um, this linear. If, if you remember from um, linear algebra, this is what linearity looks like in um, linear algebra terms. Um, so R of A plus B is equal to R A plus R B. Um, R plus S A is equal to R A plus S A. So here, this is uh, similar to scalar multiplication and linear algebra, right? So here you can think of like um, everything like R S from the module is uh, from, from the ring because here R is a ring, right? From the ring is like um, in terms of vectors, of course, I'm roughly speaking, but that's how the analogy goes. Uh, you have vectors, and these are the scalars that you can think of from a field, but here they are from this additive abelian group. So um, this is scalar multiplication with addition, and this is the um, associativity of multiplication. Right? Um, if your ring is a unital ring, so it satisfies. Um, It satisfies um, the. Uh, it has the identity element. Then you're going to have um, the um, elements from the additive abelian group. Um, the you know work according to the identity essentially. And now if now it will make it an unitary uh, module. So um, 
these are the properties that you're like inducing from the ring, underlying ring. Right? So, but for a module to be a vector space, you need the ring to be a division ring, and um, and it also has the identity. Then it's going to be a um, vector space. Okay. So um, uh, we're talking about like um, um, our sorry the modules in terms of left and right. So um, a right just means that you're taking elements in the um, opposite order. So instead of taking R with A, this is the order pair that you're mapping with this function. Uh, you do A R. Right? So that will be the right R module. Your your bi binary oper sorry your binary operator um, uh, is like this, right? And it satisfies all these conditions, of course. Um, but here we are. Um, I believe Hungerford um, says that it's always a left module unless um, stated otherwise. Okay, so what else? Um, mm -hmm. So he says, um, a given group A, so that's uh, the additive abelian group that we're considering, um, can have like different uh, module structures on it. So if you are uh, if you have a commutative ring, um, every module, um, every left module um, can be given the structure of a right module because your uh, multiplication is commutative and you associate a value with that, you know, makes it possible. So, that's that. Um, here we talked about the um, identity element for multiplication. But you have the additive identity element too. Uh, so that's a zero. Um, we get it from ring again. And... Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, it functions a bit differently. So if you have a module um, with the identity element 0a over a ring r um, with identity 0r, so this is the identity element 0a and a, and this is 0r, then you have to uh, say that, um, check that, um, you know, for elements in the ring and in the um, module, uh, the additive identity satisfies it, essentially. Right? So r times uh, 0a is equal to 0a and um, 0r times a is equal to 0a too, so, um, yeah. And, um, all right, so the trivial module is, um, the module with, um, just this, um, and, um, it denotes it with 0 as for rings, uh, we've seen. Um, what else? Okay, so here's an additive abelian, um, uh, sorry, unit, it's a, it's a module on Z, right? So, uh, just like we did, uh, with rings, you have, you know, rings with additive, um, abelian groups from the integers. So if you have, um, uh, he says that every additive abelian group G is a unitary Z module, um, with uh, the elements from Z and the elements from the group, right? and they satisfy um, they satisfy wait this is, I believe he's referring to something in chapter one for groups um. But yeah, we, we need the, uh, we have the additive abelian group and it has to um, satisfy the operation uh, conditions, essentially. Okay, so, let's see. Um, if you have a ring S and if you have a subring R, um, then um, you can have a module um, um, if you can make um, S a module by 
you know, constructing a module from R, right? So S, uh, it can be an R module um, with this kind of multiplication on there. Right? So you take the elements from R and you have the additive abelian group from this uh, um, S, right? So the multiplication is um, from S because S is a ring and R is a subring. So you're trying to um, essentially turn S into a module by taking elements from the subring right? and you know defining the multiplication. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not sure about the notation here. Here, I believe this uh, refers to. Um, the ring of like polynomials, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I thought it would be something else. And the second one is formal power series. Formal power. Okay, the power series. I see. So without thinking about anything having to do with convergence, just. Mm -hmm. Just infinite series with coefficients in R. Okay. Um, he has a few other examples, I guess. Yeah, he defines a few things in these examples. So, um, now if you bring in ideals, if you have a left ideal of a ring R, then you can make this ideal into a left module by um, taking elements from the ring and the ideal and you know, defining the product as you did in the ring. Oh, hello, Brian. Okay, so um, then um, you have uh, the trivial um, module is zero itself, um, and the ring is the um, is is kind of it's kind of similar to uh, we had the uh, trivial ideals. Remember the ring itself and the, um, the zero um, here is kind of um, the same. The zero and R are modules. Um, it's an ideal, I is an ideal, so you have uh, an additive subgroup of R um, from I. Now R mod I, the um, um, the quotient ring, is an abelian group, right? But um, here R mod I is an R module where you define these, um, uh, this multiplication with the cosets. So R times um, R1 plus I is a coset in this uh, uh, quotient ring. And the uh, multiplication is usual uh, as we do in ideals. Ah, he says, um, but yeah, this doesn't have to be a quotient ring, he says. Um, but uh, it's a quotient ring when your ideal is uh, two-sided, right? So you can define the uh, multiplication in both the directions. Okay, um, now we also introduce how homomorphisms work. So if you have R and S as rings, F I is a homomorphism, uh, then every um, S module A, so if you have a S module A, uh, can be made into an R module uh, by defining um, Right, so you define this uh, homomorphism for um, these things. How that works is you have um, Rx, um, where x is from A, so A is your S module. You make it into an R module because you have the homomorphism, so you can just get the images of this little r. Uh, so that will give you elements in S, and then you uh, continue the same multiplication. So you, Rx becomes phi of Rx, and this... Um, these would be the elements in the S module A, right? Sorry, in the R module. So <laughs> this is confusing because S module is like the module generated from S, and R module is something that is like generated from R, right? So, so yeah, this is um, 
this is um, from R. So one says that the uh, R module structure phase is given by pullback along phi. Right, so you have like, um, if you, I'm not sure if you know like how the pullback works in like categories, um, but here you're essentially, um, <laughs> in a sense, pulling back these elements um, um, phi of R into R and then um, defining module there. Okay, so that's how homomorphisms work. Um, then um, he talks a bit about the endomorphism ring. Okay, so if you have an abelian group, uh, then the endomorphism uh, ring that you get from this, um, then he says that um, A is going to be an unitary module that is generated from this endomorphism ring, and your multiplication there is defined as uh, follows. You have F A, um, where F is an endomorphism, um, and it's, um, it, it essentially it takes an endomorphism and you apply an element from the abelian group to it, uh, and the rest of it is a trivial um, how endomorphisms work. Okay, so uh, then the trivial module structure is essentially this: you have a ring. Um, then every abelian group can be made into this R module uh, by defining the trivial module structure. You know, you just say that you have elements from R and A, you multiply them, you always get zero. So you have um, an R module that is a zero. Okay, so let's see a few other things. Oh, we have Mika here. Okay, hello Mika. Thanks for joining. Hello, hi everyone. Thank you, Divya. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're just um, trying to um, start with modules. Um, okay, so um, we define how an homomorphism looks like from a module to a module. So you have two modules A and B over um, the same ring R then a function um, from these modules is this uh, R module homomorphism um, which satisfies these conditions. Essentially this is like a linear transformation in um, a vector space uh, but it's a linear transformation if this is a division ring and you know you get the vector space conditions but other than that it satisfies these conditions. Right? So if we apply this function to two elements to the addition of two elements um, um, from the ring and the like um, A and B you get um, you get how the homomorphism works right so you have f of A plus f of C and f of R A gives you R f of A how exactly how scalars and linear transformations work um, right so um we're not going to, yeah, right, he says that our module homomorphisms are going to call be called homomorphisms because um, it's a too long word to say that it's an R module homomorphism. <laughs> um, right, if you have this uh, homomorphism between modules, it has to be a homomorphism between the underlying additive abelian groups. Um, you see that? Um, because um, as this works, for the elements of the um, of the ring, so it's going to work for the um, you know um, additive abelian groups. Um, so we've we have not seen like monomorphisms and epimorphisms in a long time since we did a Luffy, I guess. Um, but um, um, F is going to be a monomorphism if it is injective. It's uh, an epimorphism if it's subjective, and isomorphism if it's bijective, right? So, everything follows. The kernel of um, this uh, module homomorphism um, 
is like is going to be um, it's going to be like the kernel you see in um, groups and in, in group homomorphism essentially but here the groups are abelian groups right so you have homomorphisms between abelian groups and thus the kernel of this uh, module homomorphism is essentially the kernel of the underlying um, group homomorphisms between abelian groups um, so kernel of f is all the elements in the module a that get mapped to zero uh, and similarly the image is defined uh, in that way mm -hmm. so theorem 1.2.3 i believe this is again something from the groups um, he says that f is going to be an r module homo monomorphism so it's uh, this a module homomorphism is uh, a monomorphism or is injective if and only if the kernel is zero right so the kernel is trivial um, and the second um, it's going to be an isomorphism if and only if um, this holds essentially the composition of these module homomorphisms um, um, satisfies with the uh, identities on the modules right so GF if GF is equal to um, the identity on A uh, and FG is equal to identity on B so the identities uh, work sm smoothly and thus giving you the homomorphism that we need he talks about uh, this example of how um, you know the zero map it's going to be a module homomorphism so the zero map zero takes you from a to b and it uh, takes elements a and um, maps it on to zero in b um, it's a module homomorphism now mm -hmm. right so um, this um, zero map is always a module homomorphism for any module say because you can always map things to zero and its kernel is going to be the whole A itself, right? Um, now, he says that every homomorphism of abelian groups is a Z-module homomorphism. Um, right, because uh, we saw that every abelian group uh, can be made into um, a unitary Z-module, right? And uh, he follows with the same example. So if R is a ring, then the map R that takes you from R of X to R of X, um, just like, okay, it takes a function F and it gives you X times F. So this is also a module homomorphism, but it is not a ring homomorphism. And you can check why that's not a ring homomorphism because, um, you know, it does not... Uh, It does not work with the underlying ring. Um, yeah. It wouldn't work for multiplication. Right. Mm, yeah, exactly. So that's the um, module homomorphisms. So we consider what um, what submodules are, and you know, again, as you can guess, submodules are going to be like subspaces and vector spaces. Uh, so if you have a ring R, um, uh, and then you have A as an R module, and B is some uh, subset of A, right? So B is a subset of A, then B can be made into a module. Um, that is induced from A in some sense. So B is going to be a sub-module of A. Uh, if you can have um, like an additive structure on B, so B is going to be an additive subgroup of A. Um, so you're like um, essentially, um, you know, borrowing the additive structure from A, and um, you define the multiplication in this manner. So. You take the elements from the ring, you take the elements from um, B, 
and um, we have this multiplication and this is going to have a sub module so um, a sub module is going to be a vector space uh, if your ring R is going to be a division ring right so of course as you can guess the sub module is a module of its own right it's just that the additive structure um, is um, from um, the parent module okay so he does uh, kind of the same deal with um, sub modules about ideals and stuff um, but first if you have a ring then um, you have this as a module homomorphism then the kernel is always going to be a sub module of your um, domain A right and your image of the homomorphism is going to be a sub module of B just like you have in um, group homomorphisms and ring homomorphisms and you can also have uh, the pre-image of a sub-module so this C is um, a sub-module of B then F inverse of C is all the elements from A that get mapped to C right? so that's the um, that's also sub-module but it is very analogous to the concept of pre-image Um, let's see. So if you have an ideal, left ideal, um, of a ring R, then, um, you have an R module A, and, um, S is a subset of A, then you can have IS, so IS is like having the, um, this looks a lot like the linear combination, remember? So you have R, um, elements from the ideal, and elements from the um, subset S and you have this linear combination of them you add them you first multiply them and then you add them uh, over some uh, integer and um, this a product um, set or whatever you're going to call it um, is, a, is going to be a sub module of A right so you can turn a subset S into a sub module by you know um, inferring the um, 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 inferring stuff from the ideal because the ideal is additive you also get the additive um, structure for free right so this turns into a sub module I think he gives it as an exercise but the exercise is essentially trivial if you think about it you have the ideal you have the additive abelian group structure underlying it so you can just you know get the properties from there and turn this into another module okay so let's see what else um, if you have a family of submodules then the intersection of all the elements in the family is also going to be a submodule of A. Okay. Um, now we're going to like introduce some other stuff. Um, like we saw in like uh, groups, you have like um, finitely generated groups and you know stuff like that. Uh, something similar happens in modules too. If you have a subset um, of a module A, which is an R module. Um, then the intersection of all the submodules of A which contain the subset is going to be a submodule altogether and this submodule is generated by this um, subset okay so um, if your um, subset is a finite subset then uh, it generates uh, a finitely generated module that's B uh, if it's just the null set uh, it's going to generate a zero module uh, if it contains just a single element um, then the submodule generated by X is going to be a cyclic submodule generated by this element so this is very analogous to uh, the cyclic subgroups uh, stuff that we've seen um, and 
Yeah. And you can also have um, a sum of the modules, right? So um, this is uh, you have a family of submodules of a specific module. Then uh, the module that you generate by you know summing up um, all this, uh, all the family members, then you're going to have a sum of the modules. Okay. Um, so we have a big theorem here, which um, proves a lot of things. He doesn't um, prove all of this. Some is some of it. Some of it is an exercise, but it's pretty um, easy to see. So you have a ring R. Um, you have a module A. Um, now you have a subset X of A. And you have a family of submodules of A, right? So you define uh, this set capital R A as um, um, it containing it contains elements um, which are multiple which are products of um, A with the elements from the ring, right? And uh, they say that R A the set is a submodule of A and uh, you do that by defining this map uh, going from R to R A which takes this um, which takes stuff from this ring and it gives you uh, this product um, and you have a module over that so um, this map um, is going to be a, an epimorphism so it's surjective as you can see Um, then the cyclic submodule that is generated by this element A is going to be like this. So you have R A plus N A, where N is just uh, some integer. Um, so this is going to be a cyclic um, submodule. Mm, right. So you're generating um, first. You generate this um, set. Uh, and you're generating just from this element A, right? Because all you're doing is you're multiplying this element A uh, with uh, elements from the ring and the integers. So, uh, and then you turn this into a, a submodule. Um, mm -hmm. And if your ring has a density and it's a unital ring, then um, this cyclic submodule is going to be the entire set R A, and uh, one can see how that works. Mhm, mm mhm, mm mhm. All right, so. I'm kind of trying to think where he's going with this. Um, right, so we have the direct sum, the direct product. Um, we define the category of R modules. Um, okay. And we have the um, exact sequences, so a bunch of things to go through, so we better speed up. Okay, so um, the last part of this theorem is that if you have a submodule D generated by this subset X, and it works like this, essentially the linear combination of elements from um, R with A and um, elements uh. from X um, with uh, the integer, right? So this is another submodule. I'm trying to think uh, why he's doing this, the, why he's doing this, you know, He's trying to have some kind of um, 
structure generated from X um, along with this um, sub module that you have that is a so um, you take elements from a and um, you have some additive structure um, on X and that lets you have a sub module so the sub module D generated by X is like this um, but if R has an identity and you have like um, um, A is an unitary module yeah then uh, D is going to be just R times X R times X Mm -hmm. I think he's trying to keep us from jumping to conclusions. I think we're really used to thinking about the span of a bunch of vectors. Yeah. It's just being all linear combinations of something in the field times uh, one of the times the basis elements. But he's saying that if we're not working with a field, in fact, we're working with a ring that doesn't have a one in it mm -hmm. then the span or the submodule span is actually bigger than just those linear combinations we also have to take basically all the multiples and combinations of multiples of the elements so like if our ring is 2z mm -hmm. then if we just took 2z times something then that would leave out a itself thinking about part three okay oh uh, sorry part two so if we wanted to look at the submodule generated by just one element if we just took r times a that would just be basically all the even multiples of a mm -hmm. whereas the span of it really should be it generates all multiples of a so he's saying your intuition is right if you're in a unitary ring. That right. the so these submodules are actually bigger than that if you're not in a unitary ring. Yeah. And this is like a way to, you know, generate the intuition for why you need the identity and the unitary condition, um, you know, to have a division ring and then. I mean, he is using D for the same reason as well. He's going to turn it into a division ring. Uh, sorry, it's uh, into a vector space underlying um, this division ring. Okay. Uh, the last one is about the family. Um, the family just means that the sum of the family consists of all the finite sums of the elements from each family member, so, yeah. The proof is an exercise because I believe all of these are, like, pretty trivial to check, uh, aren't they? I mean, the first one is, uh, is trivial to check why it's a submodule, then, um, the cyclic submodule part, you'll have to check a few conditions, the third one, you probably would have to do some effort, but, yeah. And there we come to the um, you know, canonical epimorphism, so what is analogous to projections and um, categories and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, if B is a submodule uh, of A over the same ring R, then the quotient group um, A mod B, right? So, um, A, because, again, remember, B is a submodule of uh, A, so it has the additive structure and is, um, you know, it's actually a normal um, subgroup of the additive group underlying the module A. So A mod B is going to be is, is a quotient group. Um is an but it all it is also an R module if you apply this action um of R on the group which is 
essentially um, this uh, you know like we did for the ideals you have R times the coset which is um, A plus B and you get R A plus B and um, that's how you define uh, the multiplication the action on um, this quotient group making it into an R module and here you can define uh, how to get the quotients directly from the elements of A um, so this map pi taking you from A to the quotient um, module um, you know takes every element A and it gives you the corresponding um, corresponding coset in the quotient module right? and this is of course subjective as you can see Um, and this is called the canonical epimorphism or the projection. So this is the same kind of canonical um, homomorphism or whatever we've seen in um, quotient groups. I believe it was Artin. Um the proof he provides a sketch of the proof i don't know how easily we're going to get used to this but um jp do you have like um a way i mean the way i kind of go through proofs is like i kind of try to you know do it myself and then look how he does it but here the sketch of proof essentially uh gives you kind of the first few steps and then says that you you do it how do you think we should, you know, tackle this? I, I kind of think that this one is is pretty easy. Like he says, I think that the next several theorems, though, are where he's adapting the isomorphism theory theorems from groups to modules, and he has kind of a a characteristic way of doing it. He proves, first proves like one great big theorem and then more or less derives every, all three isomorphism theorems from that. That's what mm -hmm. he did back in chapter one. And all he's going to do in this chapter is basically say, see chapter one. <laughs> Essentially going from groups, right? Okay. He's For, for his proofs, he's going to say, see... Chapter 1, Corollary 5.9. That's pretty much all of his proof in this section. So I, I think that all we can do today is just make sure that we see the connection between this and the isomorphism theorems that we're used to. Because mm -hmm. I don't think you really want to be flipping back and forth and trying to prove it live. Because mm -hmm. he's not providing them here. Okay. Yeah, give me a minute, I'll be right back.
Okay, so... Mm. Um, the proof of this one, this theorem, um, looks uh, fairly similar to how uh, we've done uh, how we've done um, exactly this proof in R10 for um, the canonical uh, map, isn't it? Um, you just deal with the cosets and then uh, you try to. Uh, but here we have to uh, use the fact that uh, you have a module, right? You have the submodule B. So um, A is an additive abelian group. It's a normal subgroup. Um, a mod B is a well-defined abelian group. Yeah. Um, a plus if if you have two um, courses that are um, the same but dif but generated by two different elements A and A prime, um, then um, A minus A prime is going to be in um, B, right? Um, but B is a submodule, so um, if you have R of R A minus R A prime is going to be equal to, because R is an element from the ring, so you can take it out um, because it's a module. So you have the multiplication defined there. Uh, so um, this. Uh, okay, so th yeah, <laughs> it's going back to the um, groups again, but um, RA plus B and RA prime plus B uh, with the action that you need um, is well defined. So if we just take a look at what this crawl region is, it should look something very familiar. 1.5 Mm-hmm, this one. Right. Mm-hmm. So, we have the canonical um, projection. What do we do with that? Um, we do something similar to what we did last time in groups. We have the isomorphism theorem. So we're going to um, like develop until there. But let's see what it does. So, um, you have a ring. Uh, we have this module homomorphism between two modules. And C is a submodule of the kernel, so it's uh, analogous to having a subgroup containing the kernel of the group homomorphism. So you have a submodule containing the kernel of the module homomorphism. Um, you have a unique uh, oh, module. Let me interrupt. That, yeah, that's actually backwards. It's this is a submodule which is inside the kernel. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I messed it up then. Yeah, yeah the submodule. Is the submodule of the kernel okay? Yeah. Hmm. So this is paralleling what he did back in um, chapter one. The big bulk of this is a general fact. Then notice the last few words. In particular, a mod the kernel is isomorphic to the image. That's the first isomorphism theorem. So he's proving something big, a little bit bigger than the first isomorphism theorem, and then drawing the first isomorphism theorem as a corollary. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to prove it. He just says go back and look at 1.5.6 and 1.5.7. Uh, I mean, most of it is kind of um, analogous, isn't it?
It is. The, the big idea is that we're working with abelian groups here that have an additional action of a, of a ring on them. Mm -hmm. So you use the old theorem for groups to show that everything carries through with groups. You only have, even have to worry about normal because all the groups are abelian. Then you just have to make sure that the action of the ring on the new group works out. That it's well defined and that it carries through to the quotients or whatever we're working with. Exactly. So you're checking that extra module structure. Mm -hmm. Basically get all the group stuff for free because we've done it before. You're just verifying that the module stuff works. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> he, he says it. Okay, I mean, then he shouldn't really write this thing like proof and then, you know, a QED um, because, well, I mean, you're not really <laughs> giving a proof. You're just like referring it back to chapter one. But, yeah, so we'll go through the proof statements um, and um, I would recommend kind of trying to if you I mean it's, it's, a, it's a good exercise to like get used to the language of um, you know modules I guess and how they work from the groups so um, I would say try and practice the proofs uh, it'll be a good exercise also for like you know the isomorphism terms that we proved in groups and it's it's been a few weeks I guess more than a month, so, yeah. Does he actually give, like, big proofs of, like, theorems? I guess, yeah, this one is there. Okay, he has, he has. Okay, let's see. We're going to the categorical stuff soon. So... What does the first theorem say? Okay, so you have this ring, um, you have the R module homomorphism, you have a submodule that is contained within the kernel, okay, I was saying it wrong. Um, then you have a unique um, module homomorphism taking you from this quotient group to um, the module B, right? So you have this quotient group which generates a module and you have this homomorphism taking you from there to B, and it satisfies um, the necessary conditions. Um, and you have the same for like um, other things. So essentially, this um, homomorphism is kind of very special because it is unique, and the image of this homomorphism F bar is equal to the image of the original homomorphism um, F, right? and the kernel of this homomorphism is equal to the kernel of f uh, mod um, whatever the, the submodule c, right? So, yeah. And um, f bar is an R module homomorphism, uh, sorry, isomorphism is going to be an isomorphism if and only if um, your underlying, the original homomorphism is actually subjective, so you need the subjective condition uh, from the uh, original homomorphism, you know, thus, you know, it's going to be an epimorphism, and then your submodule is going to be the kernel of the original homomorphism. Okay, yeah. In particular, we need the um, the ah. Uh, Wait, did you define how like how division works with like modules? I mean, if you have like a module and then you like take a quotient, I mean, okay, it's the same thing. You have uh, this uh, module A um, quotient, the kernel of the original homomorphism, and that would be isomorphic to the image of F. So he doesn't give a diagram, but maybe he does it in the like. Um, Group section, but um, 
is quite similar to what we've seen in groups. I think we're on our own. I think we have to draw our own diagrams. Yeah. <laughs> Which I did, because I can always understand it without one. Okay. Did someone join? Oh, Ubermensch. Okay. Ah, okay. So... Yeah, as I said, go through the proofs in the groups chapter. Uh, it'll be of good practice, I believe. Um, the corollary um, is again from um, one of the corollaries from the group. Um, let me see. I'm interested in like um, what um, Jacobson, because I, I quite like Jacobson's uh, treatment of modules, but I didn't see it uh, that well. Right, he starts from uh, the categorical, like straight away. He defines um, the categories of R modules, this R mod and mod R, uh, left and right. And um, he has the co kernel, the kernel, he directly you know, gets into the short exact sequence. Okay, I mean, he assumes, uh, I mean, of course, he should assume because this is like volume two, so in volume one, you probably have seen modules. So. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe I can get a few categorical exercise for the p-set from here. Ah, he lets the reader prove the short five lemma, which we're going to see in a few minutes. Okay, so what the scrollery says, uh, you have a ring, um, you have the submodule, um, a prime of A and B prime of B. You have this homomorphism from A to B um, such that the image of A prime uh, is a subset of B prime. Right. Then um, F induces uh, another module homomorphism, um, F bar. So F is going from A to B, um, F prime, sorry, F bar goes from A mod A prime to uh, B mod B prime. This is all possible because all of these are submodules, so they, you have the quotient group structure underlying them. Um, and it does, what it does, it takes you from one coset um, in A mod A prime, so that's generated by A, then uh, takes you to B mod B prime that is generated by the image of A. Right? So we have F of A um, plus B prime. So um, this homomorphism is going to be an isomorphism if and only if the image of um, F plus B prime is equal to B. So essentially, um, I mean this is the case, right? So if all of your um, F of A's um, you take them all. You take all of them, uh, and that will give you the image of f um, plus b prime is equal to this b itself. Um, then um, you have the isomorphism condition, and the pre-image of all the elements in b prime is a subset of a prime, more like a submodule of a prime. No, it's, it's a subset because this is a pre image, right? Yeah. Um, now, F is going to be surjective, it's going to be an epimorphism. Um, F, F of A prime is equal to B prime, and the kernel uh, is contained within A prime. Okay, so that's here we're trying to find kernels. Um, we're going to find modules, submodules that contain the kernel. So here, the kernel is a submodule of A prime. Um, then you have the isomorphism between uh, these two things.
He doesn't uh, mention these uh, theorems as the isomorphism theorems, or does he? No. He does not, but 1.9 right there contains the second and third isomorphism theorems. Yep. And the lattice isomorphism theorem is below that. One ten is the lattice isomorphism theorem. Mm, right. That's what you were thinking earlier. You were thinking about C as containing the kernel mm -hmm. of the mapping. Is this correspondence between Submodules containing the kernel and modules of the target. Then F is an epimorphism. Mm -hmm. Right. So this one, um, yeah, as you said, this contains the second and the third isomorphism theorem. Um, if you have an R module isomorphism, you have these submodules B and C. So B mod B intersection C uh, is isomorphic to B plus C mod C. Uh, B plus C mod C, yeah. So um, again, it's, it's a good exercise to you know try and prove this um, from the stuff we've done with groups. Um, maybe I'll try this too. Mm, and if C is contained within B, then B mod C is the submodule of A mod C. Uh, so this is the third one, right? Um, then you have the homomorphism between the product of A mod C with B mod C, uh, and it's isomorphic to um, A mod B. I think we did that in rings, right? I think I put it as an exercise. Yeah, the McLean exercise, I remember. Okay, okay. Um, then this is the other theorem. You have a ring, you have a submodule, uh, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of all submodules containing the B, containing B and um, containing B and the set of all submodules of A mod B um, given by this. Hence, every submodule of A mod B is of the form C mod B, where C is a submodule of A which contains B. Right? And this is um, uh, kind of similar to um, the correspondence um, theorem we had in the um, groups. Um, Remind me the lattice isomorphism theorem. I'm kind of forgetting it. Um, I think I might be naming it wrong. I was thinking the correspondence theorem. Right, correspondence theorem. Right. <laughs> that, that's the thing. I think um, Artin says it's the correspondence theorem. Like, I think it was Dummett who brought in the lattice. I, I didn't like hear the word lattice before. Okay. So after that, the 111 through 115 are all talking about uh, direct products and sums. Mm -hmm. and then after that, 116 to the end of the section is all about exact sequences which we need to go through. And I think he's going to use this direct product on some there. Yeah, in a small way for the split ones, the split sequences. Mm -hmm. Right. 
let's see. <laughs> so, this theorem is an exercise. This is an actual grad book. <laughs> Everything is an exercise or a reference. Um, you have a ring. Um, you have a non-empty family of R modules. That is, um, these A with the uh, indices I. Um, the direct product of the abelian groups AI and the direct sum of the abelian groups AI has these things. So this, uh, remember, we have the direct sum and the direct product from groups. Right? So he's talking about the abelian groups and we're going to consider those. So the product of, uh, the direct product of abelian groups uh, is going to be a module where the action uh, of the ring is given in this manner. We're trying to have is this notation for like a cyclic group generation or something else? So he introduces that notation again back in chapter one, like 1 1.8 or 1.9. So the direct product of groups is a set of all functions into the set of groups. Mm-hmm. And instead of writing f of i, he's replacing that with the curly brackets a sub i. Kind of like how you use subscripts to indicate a function when you're talking about um, infinite series. Okay. So the a sub i's are kind of like what would correspond to components if we had a finite direct sum. Mm, okay, so R with this bracket AI is essentially like um, R times the summation, direct sum of all the AIs, right? Yeah, if this were a finite direct product, rather, then we would have parentheses oh, a, product, a sub right? 1, comma a sub 2, and yeah, so forth. Yeah, 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 makes sense. So this is, okay, so this is like a better way than like having the parentheses, I guess. You have normally the parentheses which represent the components. Yeah, but here we're not, we mm -hmm. don't know that we have a finite right. family be. of modules. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, that was the direct product. The direct um, sum is a submodule of the direct product. Mm. Okay, for each k, for each index k, the canonical projection takes you from the product, the direct product of modules to um, direct product of abelian groups to um, an element, um, right? A yeah, and as what is it called? A factor, yeah, a factor of this product. So that's the kth factor. And this is subjective. So that's the canonical projection. The canonical injection is essentially injecting um, this into the uh, direct sum. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's um, one so more. The only reason. time we make yeah. a distinction between the two is when we have infinite, infinitely many modules or infinitely many groups. 
If there are finitely many, then the direct product and the direct sum are the same thing. But if there are infinitely many, the direct sum is functions of the index set into the collection of groups such that all but finitely many are sent to the identity. So it's like if we, something easier to think about would be just sequences of numbers. So the direct product is like all sequences and the direct sum would be all sequences for which all but finitely many are zero. Right. Or if it were decimal numbers, then the product would be like all decimal numbers. And the sum would be like all decimal numbers that eventually terminate. So all but finitely many are zero. Mm hmm So that's one reason that the sum is a sub-module of the product, is because when it's an infinite um, collection of modules, and it's strictly smaller. Mm -hmm. Right. And then back in Chapter 8, you got all that categorical stuff that I didn't that I don't understand yet, which is explaining why, why one of these things is a product in the category and one is a co-product in the category. Together with these pies and these projections and injections. So this theorem is setting, setting us up for understanding why one is a product and the other is a co-product in the category. Right, I think, yeah, it's going to make more sense when you go categorical, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we did have some issues with the co-products back when we were doing a Luffy, but we'll see. Okay, so this is the direct product of a family, the, the direct sum, they say it's an external, they're going to define internal, I guess it's going to be the same way like kind of Rotman did for finite abelian groups, um, but let's see, if you have uh, finite, um, the index is finite, so a finite number of modules of the family, Direct uh, product and the direct sum coincide exactly, and they will be um, like this with O plus. Theorem 1.12, 1.13, Let's see. The essence of 112 is the last sentence, which is that the the direct product is a product in the category of R modules. And 113 is saying that the direct sum is a co-product in the category of R modules. Yeah, and it doesn't even revise why it's a co-product. If you just say, go back to chapter one. Yeah, being a product or a co-product has to do with those universal properties. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So 12 says that um, there's this unique module homomorphism taking you from an R module um, to this um, direct product. Such that the um, canonical um, 
e to say, okay, yeah. so there's this pi i um, of phi, pi i of every phi that you have is equal to phi i. Essentially, um, you have this like a family of morph homomorphisms, and um, you say that there is only one uh, homomorphism which can take you from C to this product such that when you have the composition with the uh, canonical um, projection, is the projection of the is the projection right? Right, yeah. The projection um, composition phi is going to give you a phi i. So yeah, I wish he had done a diagram, but I guess it makes sense. Um, so your product is uniquely determined up to isomorphism um, by this property, um, and this direct product the product in the category of R modules. So we're going to see the category of R modules, and um, this product is um, how we're going to define the product in the um, am among the objects. Um, and morphisms in the category. Um, Thirteen. Um, you you have this family of morphisms again. The psi, right? Then there is again this unique homomorphism that takes you from the direct sum to a specific R module D um, such that when you compose this psi with the injection uh, you get this component uh, Y is homomorphism psi I for this index right and uh, this is also uniquely determined up to isomorphism and um, the direct sum is actually a core product in the category of um, our modules, as we said. Okay. It's going to be a co-product because of it being an universal property. I believe we can check um, a Luffy for this. Luffy has a chapter on uh, modules. Mm, mm, mm. My modules of a ring. The category R mod. I kind of feel like some of the proofs that um, Hungerford didn't do are present here. Mm. Uh, this is the thing that we saw, yeah. the diagram. The canonical decomposition, right? The canonical decomposition, remember we just saw that in terms of groups when we were doing it from a Luffy. And um, yeah, the Luffy way of like, you know, making diagrams and like, you know, putting it in the context of canonical decomposition makes sense. Yeah, this is for the isomorphism theorem, sorry. And this is the third. Uh, 
Okay, the first, okay, first, second, third. I don't see proofs there. Are those from the exercises? Yeah, these are exercises. Mm, okay. Yeah, this is how we did core products uh, and stuff. So. Yeah. If Hungerford had put pictures like that one, it would have been very helpful. Yeah. So this is the product. Um, okay. Sorry. I guess at this point he has defined the R mod category. So. It says the direct sum m o plus n satisfies the universal properties of both the product and the co-product of m and n, right? So the product yeah. is this, and essentially you have this um, direct sum. You have the um, projections uh, pi m pi n onto m and n, and um, this p is an R module which is like the product of this. Essentially, you have this phi m cross phi n going from this R module to this direct sum, and then you have the injections. No, they're still projections, right? Yeah. Or oh, wait. Mm. Products use the projections, and the co-products use the injections. Mm-hmm. Right. So phi m takes you from p to m. Phi n takes you from p to n. And you have this unique... Um, homomorphism between here. And this is going to be an isomorphism when, wait, when is it going to be an isomorphism? It is going to be an isomorphism, isn't it? It's an isomorphism if you have two products. So that, that's showing a, a uniqueness of products mm -hmm. up to isomorphism. Right, yeah, okay. So M O plus N, which is the direct sum, works as the product of objects M and N in the category of modules. So, nice. Whole product view the preceding arguments for a mirror. Okay, <laughs> this whole diagram, okay, that um, is, the, is the reflection. But unfortunately, what we're not getting from a Luffy is the distinction between a direct product and a direct sum when we have an infinite collection of modules. Right. And I have no idea how much we're going to be working with infinite collections. If we're always going to have finite collections, then we can just learn about direct products and not worry about the rest. Um, I'm not sure. I kind of think... Ooh, is that the injective projective stuff that's coming up? Because he has the free, free commutative module. I don't think he like generates this um, distinction. He just says you have a finite. Size. Unless he has infinite. And finite sum. Yeah, does he even define a product if you have a <laughs> infinite index set? Might be a exercise. Right. So this this makes sense why it's a co product. And Okay, yeah, we're getting there, the kernels and the co-kernels. Um, 
Okay, so that was the theorem which proved um, the fact that direct sum is a whole product. Mm hmm. Fourteen. Says, you proved something like, mm -hmm. yeah. You proved something like fourteen very recently. Do you remember when that was? In Rotman. Yeah, I think it was like the finite abelian groups. I'm not sure what that was, but it looks a lot like that. Something we've seen, yeah. Probably this. Oh, is it? I'm not sure. Uh, you have this, um, these are modules, then A is isomorphic to the direct sum of all these, if and only if, for each index, there are R module homomorphisms, okay, so you have each, for each index you have the corresponding projection and injection. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So um, these projections and injections, uh, they work nicely. So if you uh, take the composition, you're going to get the identity on the corresponding uh, module. Um, if you um, take the product of these projections and injections of two different distinct indices, then you're going to get zero. And if you have this uh, summation of um, products of injections and projections, um, then you're going to get the identity of the module. Um, okay. Hmm. So... The proof um, is essentially just dealing with the indices, as it looks to me. Um, so if um, you, know, you, you have the forward direction, um, which says that if the module can be written um, as the direct sum of these submodules, then um, 
we have the canonical projection and injections uh, which would satisfy these two because uh, that, that's pretty much easy that's only the definition of what we saw here um, and this one um, and for the last one right for the last one I believe you can just take an isomorphism from A to the direct sum then uh, then okay if you take uh, okay the composition if you compose F this isomorphism with this uh, projection or injection you're going to get stuff from A to each component and vice versa and that'll satisfy one two three Mm, okay. The other way around is kind of the same. You have the projections and injections that satisfy the these. You have to just show that new. Um, if these satisfy, then you can have isomorphism from uh, the module to the direct sum, which um, I mean, which follows from the third because the third allows you to do this. So um, you just take. Uh, these elements, um, you you have this multiplication um, that you can do. So essentially, building up the elements for the module A through the summation and the identity works. So essentially, you have um, uh, this uh, what is that? Pi i and um, i, which satisfy the three conditions um, you have um, these two as well which are like um, in the as you go from um, the direct sum to AI and the other way around okay so these are the canonical projections and injections um, now phi um, is this isomorphism? Wait, no, we have, this is the morphism that we have to prove that it's isomorphic. So, um, what is it? Phi, uh, what phi does is phi um, takes um, a sum of these things, uh, the module, so you have these um, summation of this product of product of projections and injections and um, that's how you get phi and psi is essentially that that with the prime on the other side so here you have i with pi prime and here you have i prime with pi uh, just because we need it in the other direction um, then you evaluate psi phi psi which is this you have to just sum uh, multiply these two summations um, and you know just work with the indices and um, essentially work with the indices, indices until you get this which is uh, from the third it gives gets you the identity then you multiply into the other direction which gives you the identity on the direct sum of modules sub modules right? so the you know they are inverses essentially and thus making I to be an isomorphism. Theorem 15, 15 is an exercise. Mm -hmm. And this is setting us up for internal direct sums like we had for rings.
or was that for the Belian groups? I guess that was I the Belian groups Indians, we were doing. Yeah. I'm flipping through Dummett and Foot, and it feels like Dummett and Foot is a lot friendlier in terms of giving examples and having exercises that kind of have you work through examples instead of just being definitions. They don't deal with infinite indices. Nobody else that I'm flipping to does. So I'm kind of feeling like I might need to jump over there to dumb it in foot to get more examples. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I'm not sure, but I believe dumb it would make more sense. Um, okay, so this um, is essentially um, trying to, um, if you remember how we did internal direct sum with um, finite abelian groups, it was like this, oh, no. okay, here, the internal direct sum was essentially um, trying to have uh, the subgroups uh, of a given group and taking the direct sum and having it isomorphic to the whole group whereas the uh, external direct sum was like taking elements from each subgroup and then adding them and then like creating this whole group which would be isomorphic to the original group. <laughs> Essentially that's what I get from the external and direct internal thing is that Externally, you're taking the components through the elements and like doing something external and internal is essentially you're just dealing with the subgroups. Yeah, for internal, the, the building blocks actually are subgroups, but for external, the external direct sum contains subgroups that are isomorphic to the corresponding subgroups of G. Mm -hmm. Ooh, 12, or it's half past the hour. Oh, yeah. Damn, we have still not reached the exact sequences. The short flight lemma. That's the last thing I guess. No. Okay, let's see how far we can go with this. Give me a minute.
Okay, so... So he also says how the internal direct sum is um, actually uh, isomorphic to the external direct sum. Um, right, right. The thing is, in the external direct sum, we have the um, isomorphic copies, and we're dealing with those. Um, the internal uh, ones are the where we're dealing with action modules and. But I think, yeah, we're not going to worry too much about the internal external thing. Um, so, let's get to the fun stuff, exact sequences, and how I believe in the next 20 minutes or so we can do this. So, we have uh, module homomorphisms F and G. So, you have A, uh, you go from A to B with F, you go from B to C with G. And this sequence of module homomorphism is going to be exact um, at B uh, if um, the image of F is equal to the kernel of G. See? Um, a finite sequence of module homomorphisms um, is exact if the image of a specific homomorphism at index I is equal to the kernel of the uh, following uh, homomorphism. Okay. Um, um, we're going to see, um, wait. Yeah, now an infinite sequence of module homomorphisms is exact if, okay, you know, you have like for finite indices you have up until n minus 1 for infinite um, sequence you're going to have up until the integers. So in this example he introduces the co-kernel and co-image. So um, for any module A, there are unique module homomorphisms, right, from the trivial module to A and from the module to the trivial module. Um, if A and B are any modules, then the sequences that take you from a 0 to A and then to A plus B, so that's the, um, what was that, injection, um, and then you have the projection um, from A plus B to B, and then you go back to zero, right? And you do the same for B, um, and these are going to be exact when the injections and the, um, okay, so injections and the um, projections are canonical, right? So essentially if they, uh, if they follow the condition that we, you know, we showed previously. So if you have a submodule of um, of some module D, then the sequence that you have, um, you know, where you have this, okay, you have um, the C um, included into D by this I, and then uh, D projected onto D mod C, um, and then gets to zero. And this is exact if um, um, this i is actually the inclusion map, you know, as we see it in subgroups and subspaces, and d um, to d mod c, we have the canonical epimorphism, the canonical subjective map, surjective map. Um, if f uh, is a module homomorphism, then a mod the kernel of f, um, is called the co-image of F, and A and B mod the image of F is called the co-kernel of F. This terminology, I believe, is going to be necessary in um, algebra, topology, and homological algebra. Mm hmm. 
So for each of the following sequences, uh, each of the following sequences is exact. Um, you can okay, so we can like have the sequence from um, the zero to the kernel, back to a, back to the co-image, and then to zero. Um, do the same thing again with the image, um, and you'll get to the co-kernel and back to zero. And you can do the same with the kernel and the okay. So first is the kernel and the co-image, and the image and the co-kernel and kernel and the co-kernel. Right, and um, these have to be inclusions and projections. The um, maps that take you from um, the kernel to the set, sorry, the module. Ah, so, so this is an exact sequence of module homomorphisms if and only if. Uh, it's uh, a module monomorphism in the sense that it is uh, in injective. What is this notation? This is O? Okay. Oh. Similarly, you can have something from B and C. Uh, that's going to be uh, exactive. Your, um, okay, so this is G. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't look like a G. Um, it's subjective. And when you compose them, you have another sequence, and that is going to be exact if GF gives you to zero. Zero, yeah. And a few other trivial um, extensions of what we were saying. So. You go from A to B with F, B to C with G, then to zero. That is exact. If that is exact, then um, the co-kernel of this module module homomorphism F is equal to uh, B mod the image of F, which is equal to B mod the kernel of G, and that is the co-image of G. So essentially, if that works, then the then your co-kernel and your kernel are um, are the same, and um, you have an isomorphism to C. Okay. So this kind of um, exact sequences are called short exact sequence. Okay. And here you need F to be injective and G to be subjective. That is epimorphism and monomorphism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Right, I, th I think this is the important point. That if you have a short exact sequence, then you can say that the um, A is isomorphic to the image of F, and B mod the image, or B mod the kernel, is equal to C. Is isomorphic to C, okay. Hmm. Now the short pipe lemma. Let's see what this thing is. So we'll do this and then a few other things. Another proof of the split and split exact. And then we're done. So this pipe lemma. Um, you have a ring and you have this. Um, you have that short exact sequence from um, A to B to C, so F um, takes you from A to B, um, then to C, then to zero. Then you have, at, uh, on, in the bottom, you have the same thing, but with different modules. So A prime, B prime, C prime, and you have the relation between, uh, you have maps between A to A prime, B to B prime with alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so you have to show that uh, all of this commutes. Um, okay. Let me try to write this.
Right. So um, if this is commutative, um, then um, alpha, gamma are, if alpha and gamma are injective, then beta is injective. Um, that is, there is a monomorphism. If alpha and gamma are subjective, then beta is subjective. If alpha and gamma are isomorphic, uh, are isomorphisms, then beta is an isomorphism. Okay, okay. It kind of looks like it. But yeah, we'll have to um, go through a lot of compositions, and I believe that will do. And we have to use the commutativity um, for of the diagram. Okay, so you take an element from uh, the module B. Um, suppose that beta of B gives you zero, right? So um, we have to show that uh, beta itself um, is zero because that will prove that um, you know you have an element um, in B and Beta is a monomorphism that if beta of b is zero, then b is zero. That is um, to prove that it is injective. So we use commutativity. Um, beta is in the middle. So you first um, go from g, go with g from b to c, right? From b to c, you would go with g. Then uh, you come down with gamma, um, that is, you come down to C prime, so uh, you have the B all, you know, all along. Then that is uh, the same thing as doing um, beta, so you can do, you can, like, use beta to come down to B prime, right, from B, and then do G prime to go from B prime to C prime. And that is the same thing, because you're going from B to C prime. There are two different ways. Um, then that is equal to, as we said, beta of B is just zero, so that is equal to G prime of zero. And um, G prime is, remember, it's um, G prime of zero is going to be zero, right? Yeah. Because G prime is well defined. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this shows that g prime of zero is zero. Okay, and um, we had the assumption that uh, beta of b is zero, right? G prime is a zero. Okay, gamma G of B is equal to G prime of zero. Zero is simple as G of B. G of B is zero. Right. Mm hmm Because as gamma is injective, so gamma of G of B uh, is zero. So that means g of b is zero. Okay, that, that was trivial. I was lost. Um, uh, as uh, this thing is exact, so you can use uh, the fact that if you, if you have an element in the kernel of this g, um, it's going to also be in the image of f, and because that's what uh, the exactness promises us. So um, if you have some b as like um, some image of some A, so B is um, F of A, then again using commutativity, you can, um, so you have B is uh, equal to F uh, from some A, then what you do is you first uh, go um, down, 
from A to A prime with alpha, then you go from A prime to B prime with F prime, uh, and that'll also give you uh, okay, right? And that's the same thing as doing um, um, going from A to B with F, and then coming down from B to B prime with B down, right? So um, F prime alpha is equal to B tab B down F is equal to beta of B because F of A is equal to B and that is equal to zero as we know. So F prime of alpha is also equal to F prime alpha of A is equal to zero. Um, but as um, alpha is a monomorphism because of the exactness, um, sorry, and phi prime is uh, sorry F prime is also monomorphism uh, at the bottom. So alpha of a has to be zero, right? But uh, alpha is a monomorphism, so a has to be zero. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same argument repeating repeatedly, um, and And I believe we do the same thing for um, the other two. What is this uh, notation for the close brackets in Hungerford? Show me. Yeah, this one. I think he's just using it like parentheses. Yeah. I think it's just for nesting. <laughs> Unless... No, there are no subgroups involved. Or no quotient groups. I think it's just nesting. We have the kernel. Where is the notation page? Uh... All these proofs with the exact sequences are often just diagram chases. <laughs> right, exactly. So for um, this, mm -hmm. this one, it actually is kind of fun to skim what the idea is and then see if you can put it together yourself. Yeah, chase until you get to the right place in the diagram. <laughs> um, okay, so what's next? Um, you can say if your exact short exact sequence is isomorphic, if um, you have a commutative diagram of module homomorphism, such that each of these F, G, and H, so alpha, beta, gamma, are all um, isomorphisms. And that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you can also have um, maps in the opposite direction. 18 seems interesting. So 18 says that you have a ring, and this is the short exact sequence. Um, then we have the following conditions. Right? So you have a homomorphism uh, taking from A2 to B. Essentially, you're like defining how the opposite direction would work, um, the inverse, so to say. So A2 to B. Uh, is a homomorphism such that G H um, is equal to uh, the identity on two, and um, the same for K, uh, which takes you from B to A one. Um, K F gives you the identity on A one, A one, and then the given sequence is going to be isomorphic to the direct sum uh, 
to the direct sum short exact sequence. Essentially, if you take this direct sum of A1 and A2, you'll get this uh, direct sequence, sorry, ex short exact sequence, including the uh, having these um, injections and projections. And uh, this is going to be isomorphic to B. Yeah. So essentially, um, you can have the isomorphism between this short exact sequence and this short exact sequence, and that'll let you have the isomorphism between B and the direct sum. So this sounds a lot like probably what um, um, uh, Luffy was getting at. It's prime, sorry, not prime canonical decomposition. I'm not sure what he does after that, but yeah. I'm also seeing this exact same theorem in Munker's algebraic topology book. <laughs> you see, I was telling you. <laughs> so yeah, he's he's applying this to um, homology sequences. Right. I think I saw this also in, um, in Jacobson. So the whoever's splitting off into that AT group soon, I think this is going to be relevant. This particular theorem yes. and just this exact short exact sequence stuff. Right. I'm thinking of starting it this or second week. I don't know. I'm kind of torn apart, and so that algebraic topology is certainly something we need to do. I'm not sure. I'm kind of thinking if we should start the differential topology, but maybe I'll have to decide. Adding much to this is already going to be a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> and we need Both something. Both of those are physics. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm hmm Okay. Right. Uh, essentially, in homological algebra, you're going to have, instead of modules, um, complexes. And by contrast of short exact sequence, we'll have a long exact homology sequence. And there, you deal with the funny, not funny, but interesting snake lemma. Okay, okay. So, um, this, um, right. So, um, if you have a short exact sequence that's sh that satisfies these, there's going to be a split, right? And the sketch of the proof looks again, now this is, <laughs> this is the same thing, but, um, looks like just a diagram choosing again but yeah this is this is this is the a sort of thing that you should do on a blackboard you not know, drawing the diagrams you know making the arrows but yeah we have to use the commutativity of the diagram and stuff doesn't look that difficult to me from what we've seen. And the exercises um, look interesting. We have the torsion submodule. Hmm. And we, then we have the five lemma, which is not short. And. Um, Next lecture will be about free modules and vector spaces. And yeah, I think free modules and vector spaces after that, projective and injective modules. Right, so this is, I guess, when it gets a bit categorical the Hellman duality. And then the tensor product, I guess. Yeah, tensor product is when we get closest to multilinear stuff. So. Nice. Uh, 
Um, we have the pizza discussion tomorrow. Um, he said, um, seven. We have done seven pizzas. Uh, I remember, like, I think in the topology or something, I think, like, the maximum amount of pizzas were eight. Eight or nine or something like that. But we have 15 more of these to go. So, good luck. My goodness. All right. Once again, drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff every day. Yeah. But, except, um, except, you know, we've developed a taste, right? We're trying different desserts. You know, this is Hungerford. We're going to Rotman again. We'll get to Atiha soon. So, different fire hoses. Yeah, I'm, I get the feeling I'm going to be spending some time over in Dummett and Foot to get examples mm -hmm. of this stuff. He does have a section which combines the exact sequences along with the projective and injective and flat modules. I don't even know what those words mean, but mm -hmm. he seems to have a lot more examples. So I think I'm going to try skimming that at least before I try okay. to read it in Hungerford. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That's not until next week. Got to get through Thursday first. <laughs> yeah, let us know any of your like insights. Um, it's appreciated. Okay, see you um, tomorrow. All right, see you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jer. <laughs>